Welcome to Emmanuel and welcome to worship. Last week we worked on your story as a part of the discipleship journey, and I hope you've been practicing with people that you trust. Well, this week we're going to put your story together with God's story, so the people you've been praying for might have an opportunity to hear. And what a blessing it will be when the ears that God has prepared to hear actually receive the good news of Jesus dying for them. Invisible God, only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Great Father of glory, your Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veil in their sight. Our Lord, we would render, O oh, help us to see, tis only the splendor of light that hides thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us now make confession of our sins. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Assured of God's great mercy, let us confess together that we, by our dark and sinful nature, are estranged from God, and by our thoughts, words, and deeds, have sinned and deserve his condemnation now and eternally. Almighty God, we repent of our sins in thought and in word and in deed. Although we deserve your just punishment, we ask for your unmerited blessing. Be merciful to us, and for the sake of Jesus, grant us your forgiveness, so that as your redeemed people, we may be made bright by your presence in our lives, joyfully serving you in time and through eternity. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that, though you used to be slaves to sin, 
you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Good morning, Emmanuel. Today we had a couple of Bible messages, and one talked about rock and sand, and the other one talked about being ashamed or not ashamed. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So the message today had to do with building a house on rock or sand. This is this was given to me after I camped on the roof a couple of years ago. There was a, a student who made this for me. It is Emmanuel, and that's the little tent on top of the roof. So anyways, we're going to see what happens when we put a house or a building on sand. And, and it looks okay right now, but if we were to take water and pour that in, oh boy, that's not... That's not looking so good. And, and I don't know if you can see it, but it's starting to like go lower and lower. And you can see the building is sinking. It's sinking. So it seemed good at first, but after time, the building sank. If we build our faith on something like sand, our faith may sink. Where if we build it on a rock, it's going to be a different story. Fill this with water. I fill it as high as I can and nothing's happening. It's sitting there on top of the rock. Because if it's on a rock, it's not going to move. That's what Jesus is talking about in the parable today. If we build our faith on the rock, it will stand strong. And the rock is him and the rock is his word. In fact, in the first chapter and first verse of John, Jesus says he is the word. So he is scripture. So if we build our life on the things the Bible says and the things that Jesus tells us within the Bible, we will have a strong faith, which takes us to our other verse, which talked about being ashamed or unashamed. And it is Paul writing to the church in Rome, and he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of of Jesus Christ, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, meaning it's for all people. And if we are strong, with our faith built on the rock, then nothing's going to waver that faith and we will be unashamed of the gospel message and want to share it with others as well. I'm going to ask that you please pray with me today. Dear God, we thank you for our faith. We thank you for what you did for us. We ask that you be with us and help us have a strong and solid faith on the rock. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. We'll see you later. Most of us have known people, maybe a lot, maybe a few, that are ashamed of something. I struck up a conversation with a woman I had known for a couple of years. and Well, I, I thought I knew her pretty well, but one day she just blurted out that she had been married four times. I said, well, you never mentioned that. And she said, well, I guess I'm ashamed. A man lost his job, which was hard enough, but what made it more difficult 
is that he lost a job because he was caught taking a box of envelopes out of the office for personal use. Now he never mentioned it to anybody. He couldn't even tell his family the real reason. He was ashamed. There's a newlywed whose marriage is not going well. When he was a little boy, some things happened that he never told anyone about. He just shoved it down inside. Now he has a hard time getting close to his new wife. He wants to, but he can't. She said, let's go talk to a counselor about it. But he's afraid to go. He's ashamed. Sometimes shame even keeps people out of church. An older couple stopped going to church after their son committed suicide. Now the people in the congregation were very understanding when it happened. But there's no way they'll, they'll ever go back because, well, too many people know their secret. They're ashamed. Once in a while, one of our church members may get in trouble with the law. I mean, it's, it's right there, splashed across the paper, before they can even defend themselves. And it's embarrassing. And even if he is exonerated, he's afraid that everybody has an opinion about it. So he stays away on Sunday morning. Other times, somebody may come down too hard and it bruises somebody's spirit. I have a friend in the ministry whose teenage daughter was attending a youth group meeting. And I mean, they were talking about faith and doubt like they do oftentimes in, in, in youth groups. And the girl got up the courage to tell the others about some of her doubts. But the youth group advisor slammed down on her. You're the minister's daughter, she said. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. My friend said it took 10 years before his daughter would even consider going back to a church. It is painful to have shame rubbed in your face. But Paul says, I'm not ashamed, which is really a remarkable thing for him to say. I mean, the Apostle Paul grew up in a culture where shame was a way of creating order. And it still happens in many corners of the Middle East today. And woe to you if you bring shame to your family. I read a news clipping of a woman in another culture who returned home after being abused by another man. What did her brothers do? Go after the abuser? Press charges against him? <laughs> no, her brothers put her to death announcing that her abuse had brought shame to her family. All throughout the Jewish scriptures, the notion of shame is a very powerful force. So I did, I did a little word search on my computer, and the word shame shows up 174 times in the Old Testament. You can hear it repeated over and over and over again in passages like Psalm 25. Oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be put to shame. This was one of the ways that people worked out a theology of works. You see, they believed that you had to be good. You had to maintain a, a good reputation. Your family needed to keep a good family name. And if there was ever a mistake, if there was ever a moral miscue, if there was an obvious and public sin, then the whole community descended on you and put you to shame. So, if anybody had anything to be ashamed about, it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, we know about his former life. He was the commander of the Jerusalem secret police. He's the man who dragged Christians out of their homes and demanded their death by stoning. He was pushy and arrogant, and always insisting on his own way. And that's how he acted after his conversion. <laughs> he says at one point in one of his letters, I think all of you ought to stay single just like me. <laughs> well, we were in a Bible study, and it's been a few years ago, when, when somebody read those words, and a woman spoke up and said, Listen, Paul, you're going to have to stay single because I don't know anybody who could live with you. You see, sometimes Paul says things that are an embarrassment to the church. 
Never read his letter to the Galatians. He's furious with those Christians up in Turkey. Uh, they're up there in Asia Minor debating the virtues of circumcision, and Paul is furious with them. He calls them stupid, and he says, you're bewitched. At one point, he gets so worked up that he says, I wish those people who are upsetting you about circumcision would cut off much more. <laughs> you do the math. <laughs> Imagine that verse is now in our Bible. When an apostle talks like that, he's an embarrassment. Paul ought to be ashamed of himself, and yet he says, I am not ashamed. So, do you suppose he's one of these people who just puts it out there and doesn't care what people think? Well, you know the type. They shoot off their mouths, they say whatever they want, and they justify themselves by saying, I'm only telling the truth. And certainly Paul has that capacity, yeah, just like the rest of us from time to time. And at times, well, we should be ashamed. You know, as a German Lutheran growing up in a small community where everyone knew everyone, I can relate. Your family name was everything. And if you ever besmirched it in any way, well, good Christians wagged their tongues and they said, for shame, for shame. Yet Paul says, I'm not ashamed. Why? The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, he says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it can take a wretched man like me and turn me in another direction. I'm not ashamed of God's redemptive power. The gospel has the authority to change our lives. It has the power to wipe away our shame. And that's the essence of what the church has to say. And it is incredibly good news. And because it is such good news, well, we ought to be able to share it readily and easily. And finally, that's what I want to share with you today. Just a really simple way to share the power of the gospel. It's called the bridge. And it works like this. So get a piece of paper ready and let's begin. So let me share, share with you how you can be sure that you have eternal life so that you can share it with someone else. So in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I draw some lines to indicate a great canyon, a great divide a separation between God and man. Just draw a little stick man on one side and write God on the other. Then say people are separated from God because of sin. It's as if we were on one side and God was on the other side of a great canyon. What separates us from God is our sin. And people have tried many ways over the years, over the centuries, to bridge the gap between themselves and God. They've tried good deeds, philosophy, even religion. But all of our efforts to bridge the gap fall short. But the Bible says that what we have earned for being a sinner is death. So as you say this, write wages, sin, and death under the man. Death means more than just physical death. It means separation from God. Now, the verse goes on to say that a gift has been provided by God, and this gift is eternal life. So, on God's side of the canyon, write gift in God in EL for eternal life. So, on one side of the canyon, we have wages and sin and death, and on the other side of the canyon, we have gift in God in eternal life. Then ask this question, which side of the canyon would you like to be? And this is where the bridge comes in. Jesus Christ is the bridge that God provided to give us the gift of eternal life. Through Jesus and his death on the cross to pay for our sins, we can cross over the canyon and no longer be separated from God. So draw an arch bridge over the canyon, then draw a cross between the two sides of the canyon. 
God provided the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. In order to cross over to God's side of the canyon, we must go through him. He's the bridge. So I'll write Jesus above the canyon and just draw an arrow through it. To cross over a canyon on a bridge, you'd have to trust the bridge to hold you, wouldn't you? Well, in the same way, in order to cross over to God, you must trust that Jesus Christ will be able to provide the way to eternal life. So, let me ask you this question. Do you trust in Jesus as your bridge to eternal life and believe that he died and rose again for your forgiveness and salvation? If the person says yes, then assure them that God has worked a miracle in their heart and they have the promised gift of eternal life. Then lead them in a confession of their faith in Jesus Christ with these simple words of Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. When the person confesses their faith in Jesus, well, you want to say a prayer of thanksgiving. And that person will want to learn more about Jesus and how to follow him. So then you can invite that person to go through the discipleship journey with you. And the good news is we have a whole pile of these little booklets out in the lobby or at the church that you can pick up and use. Paul reminds us again that God has the power to transform any life. One way to say it is that God has the power to take away our shame. In fact, the Bible says that God is not ashamed of us. So where do we as church people get the crazy idea of wagging our fingers at the world and saying, you ought to be ashamed? The good news of the gospel is that God deals with our shame. God sees those secrets that we don't want anybody to find out about us. God knows all those behaviors that we try to hide from other church people. God brings our dark secrets right out into the light where they can be seen. And then God cancels every single one of them. And he says, no more damage. As it is written, we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. The old law was clear. It's a shame to be sentenced to death and hung on a tree. But that's the, the shame that Jesus endured. And he did it to take away our shame. So despite whatever messages that parents or, or preachers or, or anyone ever told you, the gospel is not about shame. There's no shame in the gospel. And it's not the church's job to reinforce the shame that has been dumped on us. What we do is point to the Christ who died a shameful death in order to take away all shame. And so now we live in freedom. We belong to the daylight. And our mission is to invite others to share that freedom and join us in the daylight. And we can do it because we're not ashamed. We join our voices now with all who worship God, confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Celebrating the presence of the Lord in our midst, we pray for an increase of the word, asking that God's messengers may continue to speak with power among us, bringing us the good news of sins forgiven in Christ alone. Blessed Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant our supplication. Plant us like trees by living waters, that we bear the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. By your Spirit, direct our lives, that we live as God's holy people. Blessed Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant our supplication. Grant that your blessing of peace be experienced throughout the world, and that we, as your peaceable people, shine brighter with the light of your love. Blessed Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant our supplication. In this time of prayer, we also make our petitions for the sick, the shut-in, and all who this day are in need of our intercession, especially Joanne Guerin, Marlene Laramie, Tim Cruz, Amy Morgan, Chris and Diane Salick, Jeff Shakatano, Diane Schaub, and Robin Telly, that their prayers may be soon answered and, they, and that they may be supported by God's people with care in the name of Christ. Blessed Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant our supplication. Grant that we be numbered among the blessed, who bring aid to the poor, food to the hungry, comfort to the sorrowing, and hope to the despairing. Blessed Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant our supplication. With gratitude, we remember those sisters and brothers in Christ whose earthly journeys are finished and who now enjoy the promised Sabbath rest. Grant that we be guided in ways that honor their earthly lives as we anticipate the heavenly life that is to come. Blessed Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant our supplication. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Take a moment now to prepare your elements for the Lord's Supper. It was on the same night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took bread, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Take and eat the body of Christ. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. And now the body and blood of our Lord strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace.
And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift, lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Have a great week in the Lord. And as you have opportunity, share not only your story, but God's story. Do not be ashamed of the gospel, for his power transforms all of us.